Tonga on his way now to Ganguly. Wrapped on the pads and he's gone. What a start here for Henry Olonga. Oh, and this one in the air. That's it. All over. Tendulkar's out. That's great bowling. Great bowling. He's at it over Tendulkar this evening. It's Henry, really well done. Three for 13 and what a three. Dravid, Ganguly and the prize wicket of Sachin Tendulkar. India 29 for three. Olunga 3, India nil. Henry was named man of the match. See, I vividly remember that match because uh, see, we saw uh, uh, Henry Olunga after getting these uh, wickets uh, of the Indians, including Sachin and Anganguli, uh, strutting around. And uh, he, I mean, you couldn't blame him. He was young. It was a good day. That happened to be the good day of the two days. Um, basically got the top order out quite cheaply. And that was a good season for me in 98. I was bowling quick. I was strong. And... Uh, I happened to get such enough uh, out, out with a no ball and then I was so incensed with myself that I came back and gave him a great ball that bounced a little and caught the shoulder of his, of his bat and looped to point, I think. This is the moment, this is the day when Oh, wow. Beautiful. 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 Let's start with Henry Olanga. Henry, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, before we uh, go into uh, what you're up to and you know why you actually uh, gave up international cricket, uh, the talking point these days, of course, is uh, about the World Cup final, uh, India versus Australia. What's your take on Australia's win? Well, I mean, it was historic, wasn't it? I think it's their sixth win in uh, in World Cups, which is tremendous. Um, of course, it wasn't without a little bit of controversy in that yeah. I think the, the conditions of the pitch uh, had a, a very big impact on the result. And um, so I watched the whole thing. Obviously, when Australia bowled first uh, or chose to field, um, I think a lot of people were surprised by that. In fact, my wife was one of those people who said they're crazy, they should bat first. Yeah. And I, in fact, I said, I remember saying, um, when I was in school, one of my coaches said, if you win the toss, bat. And if in doubt, you you bat. <laughs> because that, that's normally the logic, isn't it? Uh, well, well, Sri Lanka especially... had this different policy, right? Uh, especially during the 1996 World Cup, where we always chased uh, a score. Mm. Um, yeah, so... Yeah. So I said to my wife, well, it depends. You know, they, I, said to, to, I said to her, they've obviously done their research and have figured out that it's better to chase at this particular ground. I can't imagine that they would have decided to bowl without some inside knowledge. And of course, as it turns out, um, the dew would have a big say in the evening and the wicket was very sticky uh, when Australia bowled. And obviously, those, it was very slow. Um, those slow bounces were very hard to get away. Um, so India, India really struggled. I mean, um, when Australia batted, they, they, I can't remember, they were three down, I think. Um, am I right? Um, head got out right at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if there was four down or three down. But either way, Australia got it at a canter. And I don't think that um, I'm a fan of... Um, cricket matches, especially a World Cup final that are decided by the toss. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure how much of an impact the preparation of the pitch went into the result. Um, I, I wasn't there. I don't know uh, what was going on. But you bet your bottom dollar that if India had won that match, they would have shut down any debate about uh, the wicket and how it yeah. played. Um, so I think they hoped they would have a pitch that would favor their spinners. And it backfired big time on them. Um, that's how I read it. And I don't think I'm the only one who's reading that. It's just unfortunate that they lost the toss. So you think that's India, how was probably, India was probably underprepared for the final? They expected something else, but the, uh, the wicket was not what they uh, anticipated? 
No, I'm just suggesting that they would have been yeah. very happy if they'd won the toss and fielded first. I don't know what they would have done. If they'd won the toss, I'm not sure that they were always going to, to bat anyway. I don't know. I think they would have bowled first as well. Um, so my suggestion isn't that they were underprepared. I just think that they had a plan, uh, and the plan was to prepare a certain type of wicket, which was probably going to favor their team more than Australia, but they would have needed to win the toss, and they didn't. Um, that's my take. I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, but I think the sad thing in one sense for Indian supporters is that India had played uh, almost flawless cricket up yeah. until the final. They had been exceptional. They hadn't lost a match. They were really the best team on display on paper. Um, they, they, they didn't have too many weak uh, points to their game. They fielded well. They bowled well and they batted well. And uh, unfortunately, on paper, it doesn't matter when you look at the trophy cabinet and you see that you didn't yeah. win. You know, so Australia have, but Australia, even even since when I played, Australia have always been a team that peaks at the right time. Yeah. They always seem to bring their best cricket when it matters. And they've been involved in some very tight contests. Of course, the, uh, the, the 99 World Cup, many people remember that tie. Uh, in which uh, they they just pipped South Africa through to get through to the final. Um, the the South Africa game here was you know could have been closer had South Africa scored another 20, 30, 40 runs. Um, there's every possibility that it could have been a lot tighter, and who knows who would have won that match. But Australia just seemed to have that thing that we used to call back in the day big match temperament. They just seem to be able to bring their big game when it matters. And they did it again. Now let's let's uh, focus on you, Henry. Uh, uh, let's shift away from the World Cup. Uh, you uh, were uh, well, one of the best that uh, uh, Zimbabwe had when it came to fast bowlers. Uh, and uh, there was definitely uh, a long way for you to go, but you gave up cricket uh, for certain reasons. Let's uh, go into that. Why Why did you give up cricket? Well, I mean, it's been 20 years now, I believe. Um, I did a political protest against the regime in Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe back in the day was being run by a man called Robert Mugabe. Yeah. Um, he's now dead. He's now dead. And um, unfortunately, uh, in many people's eyes, ruined the country in many uh, spheres. Um, and it, Myself and Andrew Flower decided to do a protest against many of the policies of the regime. They, there were human rights abuses, there was corruption in government, there were excesses and mismanagement of various infrastructure, etc. And so, you know, we, Andrew we, Flower and you like sort of discussed this uh, before one of the matches. I mean, your 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 role. That's uh, right. Black armbands, right? That's right. So we we wore black armbands. At, the beginning of the World Cup of 2003. Uh, we were doing it to protest against the government. They were symbols of mourning the death of democracy. And we were basically making a plea to the powers that be to, as it were, um, stop a lot of the excesses and abuses. So it was a very peaceful and dignified protest. It wasn't uh, in any way calling for violence or you know, in any way, a very uh, this, risky protest, uh, considering who Mugabe is. Yeah, sure, sure was. Um, I mean, Robert Mugabe's died now, he died in 2019, I think. Yeah, um, but back in the day, he was a ruthless tyrant, he was a very, very oppressive dictator. And you know, there were there was associated risks with us doing the protest, we knew what we were getting into, there was a lot of planning that went into it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, after we did the protest, there were some death threats that came my way, and so I had to flee into exile, which is where I've been ever since. Uh, so obviously, you were, they expected these death threats to come as well. You knew the uh, repercussions. Well, the well, we, we, we considered they might happen, but we thought that level heads would prevail in Zimbabwe, and that wasn't the case. You know, we uh, people have been protesting since the dawn of time against strong powers. You know, the kings have had protests, and of course... We're, you know, normally they would quash any dissenters by sending them off to 
uh, jail or cutting their heads off or something, you know. But yeah. some of us think that those sorts of uh, recriminations by dissenting voices were uh, left behind in the medieval times. But of course, that's not the case. Uh, any strong, powerful people that are offended in this day and age may well come back at you with the power they hold. And so in our case, it was, in my case, it was death threats. It was the loss of my place in the team. Yeah. Uh, for the majority of that World Cup, it was um, being vilified in the press, in the media. I had my character dragged through the mud. I was accused of all sorts of things. Um, but ultimately, I think it was the death threats that uh, led to me deciding that I, I would go into exile and not return to Zimbabwe. Did you um, ever think that you'd lose your place uh, in the Zimbabwe team? As a I mean, look, we discussed it. We discussed many um ramifications potential ramifications we looked at uh we looked at the ultimate price you can pay which is death of course um we looked at um obviously being dropped from the side and having to go into exile we we discussed all of it open uh, with open minds and and we were quite understanding of the fact that this could be the worst case scenario but we didn't think it would be because Many people had protested in Zimbabwe. Some of them had some terrible experiences after that, but many of them just carried on with their lives. And we hoped we'd fall into that bracket. But little, little did I know that uh, the Mugabe regime was less than pleased. And so, um, yes, when the death threats came, it was the worst case scenario, but we'd hoped that they, we'd be able to get our message across as members of a democracy who would allow a free press and... Uh, in fact, it's actually a freedom of expression is actually protected under the constitution in Zimbabwe. So, ironically, uh, one of Mugabe's um, accusations was that he didn't uh, allow the press to be free, that we didn't really have a democracy. And his comeback was always that that wasn't true. Whenever the West uh, brought those accusations, he would. Um, you know, come up with reasons why he felt they were uh, telling untruths. And in any case, the proof of the pudding in my life is I decided to speak out, and in spite of all the excuses that reg the regime gave about being a democracy and about um, freedom of speech being protected under the Constitution, my reality is that that, that wasn't the case with me. I had to flee. Do you, uh, I mean, looking back, do you regret taking that decision? Uh, I know people like him and Sachin Tendulkar. I was watching a video the other day, uh, and Tendulkar was also talking about you uh, as a bowler and how at uh, one of the matches he actually feared you. Um, so, you know, do you feel that if you had stayed on, you could have uh, continued to play here for more years and you know, given a lot uh, for Zimbabwe cricket? Um, well, you've got two two questions there. Do I regret it? Um, uh, well, I think. I think from one perspective, there was some loss involved with doing the protest. You know, I had to leave my country. I lost a fiancé. I, I obviously had to start afresh in, in a new country, start my life again. And, you know, there's, the, the, I, I wouldn't quantify it as regret, more so that there was a price to pay. Mm -hmm. And I think anyone who stands up for freedom will pay a price. So, you know, we, we go way back even to, I think, the 60s when the Olympics happened. And Carlos, I think it was a guy called Carlos and uh, another fella uh, did the Black Power protest for America. I think it was Smith and Carlos, uh, if, I'm my name, if my names are correct. Uh, in any case, they, they lost their careers over it. Um, but they stood up for what was right. They were standing up for, you know, the civil rights movement in America. And... Um, many people have stood up in various countries when there's been political turmoil and tried to bring certain social issues to the attention of the world. And so I think anyone who does that will pay a price, but you can never live in regret because you're doing the right thing. You know, the other option is to stay silent, uh, chase the fame, chase the glory, chase the money and the success. And all those things are good and fine. But... I think I've always tried to live my life to a to higher ideals, which has put me in situations where I tend to act on conscience. And when my conscience is bugged or pricked by an issue, 
I'm one of those types of personalities that dives full ahead uh, into the situation and decides to try and make a difference. And so, uh, obviously, um, it means that my type of person will have to face some hardships in life, but uh, we can lead, at least look in the mirror and uh, be pleased that in a world in which others stood by and didn't act, we at least tried to do something about a situation. Um, as far as my cricket career and what it could have been, I don't know. You know, I would never have been great even if I'd played another 10 years. I don't think I would have played another 10 years, but, I, you know, I was, I was in my mid-20s, perhaps, uh, when I did the protest, maybe 26, tw turning 27, I think, um, if my maths is right. Uh, but anyway, uh, maybe I would have taken another 100 wickets. <laughs> I wouldn't have taken another 300 wickets to be significant. Yeah. You know, I would never have been called a great bowler. I might have been called a great servant for Zimbabwe, but I was never going to be someone who lit the world alight with my performances. I was short, relatively. I, you know, I'm, I'm just under six foot. I'm, I was one meter 75. I was very slight. If you look at some of the photos from me way back, I was a lot skinnier than I am now. I'm a, I'm a lot fuller, a lot stronger now. Um, but back in the day, I was very uh, small, and, and uh, that meant I was injury prone. Right. So I don't know how long I would have lasted. I don't know how good I would have been had I been given another few more years. Um, it's, a, it's unquantifiable to me, so I don't dwell on it. I know that I had enough time in the sun to make an impact, and I, you know, I did on a number of occasions. I took a few wickets here and there. Best figures against uh, opposition were six for 19 against England in one-day cricket, five for 75 against India, I think, in test matches. Um, so had I taken another 10 five-wicket hold, that would have been more satisfying than what I took. But um, at the end of the day, there are many other things I've enjoyed with my life since cricket, uh, music, art, um, public speaking. And so um, there isn't too much that I look back on thinking, oh gosh, I, you know, I, I wish, you know, I wish I'd carried on playing. Well, one of the things I do regret though, is the fact that every time Murali bowled to me, he got me out yeah. or, or Chaminda Vas, they, they, they just kept <laughs> getting me out. Uh, I, so I wish I'd worked a little harder on my, my batting so that I could have been able to navigate those uh, great Sri Lankan bowlers. But um, apart from that, no, I don't have much in the way of regret. And I'm very surprised that Tendulkar said that in one match he was fearful of me because um, I, that, that's news to me. I, I remember we had this uh, uh, battle in Sharjah in 98, I think, in which I took uh, three or four Indian wickets and I got a run out and I was man of the match. And in the warm-up match, uh, the, the prelude to the final, and then in the final, he went absolutely ballistic. And he didn't play like a man who feared me. He played like a man who wanted revenge. So um, he'd been one of my wickets in the previous game, and I got him out in a way that uh, many feel he embarrassed him, I think. Um, I don't, I've never talked to Sachin about it, of course, so I don't know how he felt, but that's news to me that he actually rated me uh, uh, as a bowler that was worthy of worrying about. I didn't get that impression in the final. It's probably, yeah, maybe not in the final, probably worried about you after he got out in that match uh, at Sharjah. But, who, I mean, who would you rate? I mean, is Sachin uh, uh, someone you rated uh, as the best uh, at the time, or was there anybody else? Uh, uh, in yeah, of course. Yeah, of course, Sachin was, was a top player. I mean, that's that doesn't even need description. Um, uh, for me, I, and I've spoken consistently about this, and I played with him, many years after I retired for a club site in the UK. But Marvin Atapatu um, was a player we always struggled to get out. I think he scored something like three or four double centuries against us uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka and certainly in Zimbabwe. Uh, we struggled to get him out. So, uh, fine player. Obviously, Sanath Jayasuriya uh, was, was, I think... I think, I, in a funny kind of way, he was a batsman I got out more, uh, the most in my international career. I think you'll see that I 
you know, I didn't take many wickets, but yeah. if there was anyone I did well against, it was probably Sanath. I mean, oftentimes he'd have hit me for four, four or five sixes by the time I got him out. <laughs> but um, of course, he came and him and Kalu uh in the in the nineties, mid nineties, certainly at the World Cup ninety six. Yeah, they introduced a style of play that I think up until then, you know, had had been very conservative, and then Dav Watmore came and introduced this free playing, carefree cricket. Uh, and I think it really did set the tone for um, what we now see as aggressive cricket. You know, T20 now um, has shown batsmen that they can be greedy. They don't have to be satisfied with two boundaries and over. In fact, let me tell you, back in the day when I played, if you got to 200 with five or six overs to go, you were kind of happy with that. Back in the day, a score of 250 was really good. And a score of 300 was excellent. Now teams are looking at 400. 400 yeah. but, so the mindset obviously has changed. But I think if, if, we try, if we try to go back in history to find out when the switch happened, I think Dav Watmore should take a lot of credit for, um, you know, obviously um, uh, promoting Sanath and Kalawatharana and just giving them license to go out and hit the ball as far and as hard as they could. So Sanath... Jaisuri I'd put up there. Mark War. I really struggled um, bowling to Mark War. He was a fine player. Um, but he likes my bowling for some reason. I never really ever got on top of him at any stage when I bowled him. I, I didn't play many times against him. But uh, I think he was one of the most beautiful players to watch as well. But um, I don't think you can talk about the great players without mentioning Lara. Yeah. Uh, I played against him again very few times um but uh, i think just in one one day international and then um i never played against him again but he uh we went on a tour of the west indies in the early 2000s and he had just come back from a tour of new zealand and had been vilified i think they lost the series and uh, the journalists were very harsh on him and he took some time out so he didn't play in the test series there, uh, just just the two test matches. But um, Jimmy Adams took the captaincy from him. But I don't think uh, you can have a a description or a discussion about uh, any of the top players of my era without mentioning those two, Tendulka and Lara. They were absolute giants in the game when I played. Um, Zimbabwe cricket. I mean, politics aside, uh, Zimbabwe cricket. Are you? disappointed that uh, it never really progressed well as a team. sure sure um and there are many reasons for that one of them of course is when they lost a whole heap of players in 2004 when um the players went on strike mainly white players and i think they were if my memory serves me right they were protesting or striking against um, uh, mismanagement of the money that was in Zimbabwe cricket's coffers and also the selection policies. There may have been other things, I can't remember, but I, those two things stick out in my head as the things that they were coming against. I think that at the time, I believe Heath Streak was um, the captain and he was leading them and um, it may also have been tied in with him being sacked or something. I, I can't remember. Anyway, um, cutting a long story short, they called Zimbabwe Cricket's bluff and felt that, I think they felt the, that Zimbabwe Cricket would have to listen to them because they were the majority of the experienced players. And Zimbabwe Cricket, they felt, would not be competitive without them. Well, as it turns out, Zimbabwe Cricket decided that they would sack them for being in breach of their contracts. Um, and the result of that was we had a very young and very inexperienced team that couldn't really compete on the international stage. So for a couple of years, I think 2004 to 2006 maybe, we really, really struggled. We were getting beaten in test matches in two days. And then the ICC kind of gave Zimbabwe the option to jump before they were pushed 
And so they suspended themselves from test cricket. Carried on playing one-day international cricket, but as far as test cricket was concerned, they suspended themselves. And that really did have uh, an impact on on uh, the prospects for Zimbabwe cricket. We uh, lost a lot of revenue, of course, because test cricket brings some television rights money, gate takings, even though we don't bring a lot of, of money through gate takings in Zimbabwe. But um, it really was a pivotal point in Zimbabwe cricket's history. And we never quite recovered. We, you know, we made the T20 um, uh, tournament here in Australia recently. Um, and i trying to remember what other World Cups we played in, but ever since they made the World Cup tighter by having eight nations, Zimbabwe cricket um, has really struggled to to make to go deeper into qualifying. So we we just about um, qualified for the World Cup if we'd only beaten Scotland, I believe, in our final match, um, or we would have progressed. But uh, instead, I think the Netherlands went forward in our place. Um, uh, the the West Indies are in the same boat in one sense, aren't they? Yeah, and yeah. they've really struggled. Uh, over the last few years when they lost a whole heap of players. We, we can remember the days of Chris Gale and Dwayne Bravo and Pollard and all those guys winning uh, the T20 World Cup maybe a decade or so ago. Um, and where are they now? So I think when you lose a big chunk of players, uh, it's very difficult to rebuild quickly. There needs to be a smooth transition from a team of experienced players um, to having a team uh, that, that's got fresh faces. So, for example, in India at the moment, I think they're very unhappy they lost. Uh, we've got this T20 series starting, I think, today. And I think they've only kept one player from that uh, uh, World Cup squad. So when you make drastic changes like that, sometimes it works, but oftentimes it's, a, uh, it's, it's counterproductive. And so Zimbabwe cricket paid a price. And we've never been the same. We haven't been competitive since, although we win here and there. Yeah, I think that, that seems to be the issue with Sri Lanka cricket as well. Uh, Sri Lanka has also been accused of uh, having too many young players. Uh, but right. experience, and as a result, uh, uh, the team has been suffering. Uh, I mean, I mean you, need to, you need to shake things up, you know, because players get older, yeah. players retire, players lose form, they lose fitness, you know. That, but... but when you lose, say, you know, I don't know, half of your team, uh, and they they have collectively hundreds and hundreds of test matches or one dayers or T20 matches between them, um, that's a lot of experience that uh, defines your success. And hopefully you lose one player here every year, another player there, you know, but you can't, when you lose a whole heap, it's always difficult to rebuild. So this is why succession plans need to be in place all the time. You know, Australia um, for years has had a good academy system. They've got a good A-side system where they blood any promising young players in, in A-sides or board 11s or whatever they may be called. Um, and you slowly, gently introduce young players in and amongst experienced players to sort of pass on the baton, pass on the reins to the younger generation. But if you do it suddenly, um, no surprise that you might get some youngsters like playing like they're deer in headlights, you know, because when it comes to um, the big matches, big tournaments, and the pressure's on, that's when you need level heads. And unfortunately, you get level heads through experience. Players who've been there, done that, lost enough times, won enough times to know that you don't need to panic. You know, you can still get there. Um, so, following uh, everything that happened in Zimbabwe, now you're in Australia. Uh, and uh, uh, we see you, or oh, actually we saw you, um, singing. Uh, when did this happen? Where did uh, your singing talents start to uh, come out? And uh, you, of course... I have a great voice. Uh, you were singing in uh, uh, The Voice Australia. How did that happen? Well, you know, if you rewind a few years, I've been, uh, you know, I've been singing a long time. I, I st I'm 47 now, and I was, I've been singing as a soloist since I was 14. All the way back to Zimbabwe, I was given my first opportunity uh, playing a, a girl in a, a musical 
in Zimbabwe, a musical called Oklahoma. I went to a boys only school. And so, you know, we had to have g young boys playing girls in some of those productions. And so that's how I got into music. I, I wanted to be in a play. And then I, I, I caught the bug from there, really. I got a principal role the next year in another musical called The Gondoliers by Gilbert and Sullivan. I was given the role of Marco, um, one of two brothers who try to fall in love with some uh, some young girls. And I think they were sisters. I can't remember. But anyway, um, there was a song in that musical called Take a Pair of Sparkling Eyes. Very high-pitched song. No one else in the school could get the notes, but I could. And so I got the part. But because I got the part and because I was able to go on stage and remember my lines and remember my song, um, it gave me confidence to believe that music could be a pathway for me uh, in the future. I took part in more plays at school, The Pirates of Penzance. I took part in um, a play called Annie Get Your Gun, and I was Fre uh, Frederick in The in the Pirates of Penzance. So uh, we did many plays. I was in every single one. And at the end of my schooling, I was actually offered a scholarship to attend the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. But um, uh, within a few months of receiving the, the offer for the scholarship, I was asked to play for Zimbabwe in a test match, and that defined the next eight years of my life. But I always had an itch. I always wanted to get back into music. And in fact, in the UK, um, after leaving Zimbabwe, I spent 12 years in the UK before coming to Australia in 2017. So in the UK, I started singing a, a little bit here and there. I was even put forward for a competition called uh, the All-Star Talent Show, which I won, um, singing a song called Nessun Dorma with a friend of mine, Bruce Izzard, playing um, piano. And uh, I also was involved with Bruce um, in Zimbabwe in that we wrote a song called Our Zimbabwe, which a lot of Zimbabweans still call an anthem of sorts. So all throughout my cricket career, I was singing, uh, you know, oftentimes, and people knew I could sing. So I'd go to like, uh, I don't know if I ever sung in Sri Lanka. I might have, but I'd go to, you know, these various cricket dinners and they'd say, oh, Henry, Henry, come and sing for us. And I'd sing a song, you know. Uh, so music was a potential first career for me had cricket not, you know, come along. Uh, in any case, when I was here in Australia, I'd been here a couple of years. I started singing around the place. There was a charity that I uh, support here called Second Chances. It works with people who've been to prison and we try to get them to think about rehabilitation, etc. In any case, um, the, the lady who works for the charity uh, got into a conversation with a gentleman who is uh, the community officer um, for the South Australian Police Department. And he was a cricket fan, and he knew of me. Once he knew that I was part of the charity, uh, he wanted, and he knew I could sing. He wanted to organize a concert with me and the South Australian Police Band. So we did that in the Adelaide Town Hall. It was a great show. I had great fun doing it. But unbeknown to me, someone had either recorded it or wrote a review or got my name out there. And so a scout from The Voice wrote an email to me and asked me if I'd ever considered going on The Voice. Now, if I must be honest, I've always been nervous about that kind of show. You know, I'm, I'm nervous about... Uh, back in the day, um, people... I had an agent in the UK and they'd try and get me on various shows. Um, and I never liked the idea of you know, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, or, or uh, dancing with the stars, or, or the voice, or, because they always, they always came across to me as shows that were more contrived and controlled than first meets the eye. Right. I'm not suggesting that they are, I'm just saying that's what it appeared to me. In any case, they asked me to sign up, so initially I, was, I wasn't really interested. Um, I thought it was the show in England, and the person thought I still lived in England. So I tried to correct them, and then they said, no, 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 it's the show in Australia. So in any case, they told me what to do. About a week before the they closed the auditions, um, she said, you know, you've got a few more days. Do you want to do it or not? And I, I wasn't sure, so I spoke to some family members. I spoke to some friends, and they said, go for it, go for it. So um, I signed up on the website. Um, you, you tell them a little bit about yourself, which I did. 
someone obviously sifts through hundreds and hundreds of these online applications and then decides yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> and I, I got a yes. Okay. Um, and then I was invited to come and do a live audition um, at a hotel in the city center of Adelaide called the Mayfair Hotel. And um, uh, I was the oldest person in the room. I think I was in my, oh gosh, what was it? Nin 2019. I think I was 43-ish. I was turning 43 that year. So I was easily uh, the oldest person in that gathering. Uh, you know, they were all, I was just surrounded by teenagers, and I thought I felt very out of place. In any case, um, I was one of the few people who got put through that day uh, from Adelaide. There are only three or so people that got put through, I think. Um, and then we got through to the next round, uh, which happened in Melbourne. I had to fly to Melbourne, and we pick our song there. Uh, and then I did my live audition. Uh, they called the Blind Auditions. Um, and I got three chair turns. Um, some musicians oh, yeah. that people would know, uh, Guy Sebastian, uh, he's a great Australian singer. Another lady called Delta Goodrum, who's an Australian singer as well. And then Kelly Rowland from America and Boy George. Uh, they were all the coaches. And I decided in the end to go for Kelly Rowland. Um, and I lasted three rounds. So I got through the blinds. I got through to the uh, knockout. And then I, I was el el eliminated at the the uh, the battles. So I did okay. But in the end, I was sent home. Um, so I mean, since we're running out of time, uh, just fast forward a bit. What are you up to now? What does the future hold for Henry Polanda? Well, more music. Um I'm certainly keen to release more music and work with bands and maybe orchestras. I want to work with the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra here in Adelaide. I've worked with them already uh, on a previous concert uh, in the year of The Voice, 2019. It was a concert called Sunset Boulevard, I think it was. Uh, anyway, um, I've, one of the things I ought to mention is that I, I've just released, uh, about two, three months ago, I released my audiobook. Uh, it's called Blood, Sweat and Treason, My Story, Henry Longa, mm -hmm. Expanded Version, something like that. In any case, if people are interested in my life story to get the whole shebang, um, then, you know, if you look at um, any audiobook stores that are available, Audible, audiobook.com, uh, iTunes or Apple Music, Spotify, uh, Google Play, they're all stocking it. Now, I, as far as I understand, some uh, stores don't stock worldwide. So, for example, Audible, sadly, uh, do not have my book stocked in India, which I think is a travesty. I've written to them, and they're like, oh, we do it on a case-by-case -case basis. But in any case, um, they don't want to stock my book in India, which I think is my biggest potential market. But yeah, hey-ho. In any case, um, I want to sing some more, so I'll be releasing new music in the coming months. So one of the other things I'm getting involved in at the moment is um, cricket commentary. So um, I, I, I did some commentary a while back. I think I mentioned back in Zimbabwe, I did some commentary in the West Indies series of the early 2000s when they toured Zimbabwe. I also toured um, uh, India on a tour when I wasn't picked, and they allowed me to go there and do some commentary. And also um, I did some commentary when in Zimbabwe toured England after my black armband protest and I went to England to live. So um, it was something I then didn't do for 20 years. I haven't been involved in cricket at any level, really, apart from playing for the Lashings World Eleven. Um, and then when I moved to Australia, I'm, I'm completely out of cricket. I'm actually more involved in athletics now, um, doing uh, javelin and shot put. Uh, just because I enjoyed it when I was a young man. I took part recently in the Australian Masters and I, I got a silver medal in shot put and javelin. So, uh, but you've got to understand we're talking about a lot of elderly people who probably are not very fit. So, uh, But I was beaten by some good, good guys. Anyway, uh, long story short, that's um, keeping me occupied. But the commentary is something that intrigues me. I'd like to um, get back into cricket in that capacity. I don't want to coach. 
And I certainly am not a player who wants to go out and, you know, play again, but uh, I, I'd be pleased to coach, uh, sorry, uh, do commentary. So commentary. Those, getting involved, uh, I'm getting also, involved with Zimbabwe cricket is, is uh, certainly not uh, on the table. It's, it's very, very unlikely. It's not impossible, but very unlikely. I'm not a natural coach. I would get very frustrated. You know, I'm, I'm one of those people who, I'm a creative. I want to be doing things that are creative. So I've got a love for art. I paint a bit as well. Um, I, I do some writing as well. Um, I want to do m more audio books. Um, those are the things that bring me enjoyment in life. And I don't think coaching would. I don't have a hunger to succeed as a coach. I would love for Zimbabwe cricket to turn around, though. And if I were able to assist that in a different way, maybe I would. But certainly not as a, in a you know, not as a coach. Maybe. Maybe as someone who can be there to encourage people to think positively, uh, kind of in a in a in a larger role, such as a, a life coach or something. But you know, honestly speaking, uh, that is so far fetched in my mind right now. It's unlikely to ever happen that I'd be involved in Zimbabwe cricket. You know, the funny thing is, uh, Iswaran, I I see myself as an Australian now. I mean, I love Zimbabwe. I love the fact it gave me a livelihood, but I've kind of more or less moved on. I'm you know I'm. I, I see myself as Australian. When the Australians won the World Cup, I was very proud of them. You know, I was very pleased that they won. I know it's weird, and historically, I'll always have ties to Africa, but I've lived here now for seven years. I have an Australian wife. I have my kids are Australian. I identify more with Australia than I do with um, England or Zimbabwe, even though if I went to either of those countries, it would feel like home. But I feel this is the country I'm probably going to live in and die in. So, you know, with that in mind, um, Zimbabwe. Uh, but here's the other thing. And you have to understand something about me. I only, I've got a saying in my life, which is this. I only go where I'm invited. And I never stay where I'm not wanted. Mm. So if Zimbabwe invite me and say, hey, Henry, can you do this? Can you do that? Uh, it will give me something to think about. But as long as they don't invite me, it ain't happening. But as, I'm as some, to volunteer. Yeah. But uh, having been born and bred in Zimbabwe, what would your message be for the people of Zimbabwe? Uh, I mean, a country that has faced a lot of issues uh, from Mugabe's time and even later on. I mean, what well, would you have a message that you would want to send across to uh, Zimbabwe? Well, the first thing, if I may slightly correct you, I was born in Zambia. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and, I have, and I have a Kenyan father. Uh, and a Zimbabwean mother. And so I've lived in Zambia, I've lived in Kenya, and I've lived in Zimbabwe, and I've lived in England, and now I live here. In, in Australia. So, so I, you know, of all the countries that I've lived in and been to, this is why I'm saying Australia is has preeminence. Um, because I, and, and Australia was also very, very kind to me mm -hmm. back in the day. You know, when I started my career, I got called for throwing. Yeah. Um, and I had to go all over the world to fix my action. And I, I spent some time in India. The Indians were very kind to me, too. I worked with uh, Dennis Lilly and a man called Shaker and a few others in Madras, as it was called then, at the MRF Pace Foundation. Then I came here in, in 96, and I worked with, again, Dennis Lilly, a guy called Wayne Phillips, another man called Richard Doan, uh, um, I think Michael Divinuto. I think, I think his first name is Michael. Uh, Rod Marsh, of course, ran the academy, and Dennis Lilly popped in once in a while. Um, but while I was here on that trip, the Australians were very, very kind to me as well. So Australia has given me a lot in my life. They gave you, they played a role in giving them, giving me my cricket career back. Of course, um, we had a lot of cricket coaches from Australia. So when I played, we had Jeff Marsh, we had Carl Rackerman. Uh, for a brief moment in time, we also had um, Jeff Thompson. So Australia is a country that, f even before I came to live here, felt very familiar to me. And the Australian way of life and the way they did things appealed to me. Now, as far as a message to people in Zimbabwe, I, look, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure they'd want to listen to me or, or what, I'd, what I could possibly contribute. But, you know, I wrote a song many years ago called Our Zimbabwe. Maybe if there was a message that I could give to the people of Zimbabwe, it would have those sentiments that were in that song which go along the lines of you know 
taking a stand to build the country, make it a better place. Um, and, you know, there are people who are doing that in Zimbabwe, and I encourage them to keep doing it. Um, but the, the saddest part of this whole chapter for me, the whole Zimbabwe saga, is that the people who fought in the war of liberation, who are now leading the country, um, are also, you know, the, the, and they did it on the ticket of trying to empower landless black people or black people who didn't have a vote. There was this terrible war which lasted for 10 years, 10 year civil war. Now, I have no idea how long the civil war in Sri Lanka, uh, where you're from, happened uh, for. I don't know how long it went on for. But of course, when, when peace comes, it comes with such a, an, an optimism and a hope that people have because the war has ended, there's no more bloodshed, there's a curfew, etc. And with that came the promise of a new start, a new country, the birth of new opportunities. And you would imagine that the fathers of the nation would uh, not enjoy the spoils of this new nation and keep it to themselves but would instead want to empower the next and future generations um, so that they can have the opportunities that they didn't have. You know, th that was, when I grew up, I always understood that parents were there to give their children a better life than they had. You know, it's, it's such a ubiquitous thing throughout the world that parents strive to equip their children with tools they didn't have, opportunities they didn't have. And... You know, ultimately, sadly, from my perspective, the saddest thing about Zimbabwe, ever since I was Zimbabwean and my transition into becoming a foreigner, etc., the saddest thing is that the very people who purported purported to be the, the revolutionary war heroes and the people who led Zimbabwe into a new era with all the promises they give at each election uh, are the perpetrators of the most heinous human rights abuses and violence against their own people. And that makes me really sad. And so I don't know what the solution is. I suspect it, it's got something to do with younger people getting involved in politics, trying to bring change through that. Uh, and if, if the change isn't political, maybe it's an ideological change that people in Zimbabwe, you know, ought to try and have a slightly more American outlook in life. You know, I'll tell you something funny is that so many people in Zimbabwe absolutely hated me for what I did. Uh, maybe, maybe because some of them think I brought politics into sport, which was inappropriate. Uh, others people thought I betrayed the, the, you know, the name of the country or whatever. But ironically, um, it's, it's weird that I, someone who was trying to do the right thing in good conscience, representing other people, not myself, because I was living a good life. Um, I was vilified and targeted as the bad guy. And yet the very people who are perpetrators of violence and evil and corruption against the people of Zimbabwe seem to still be lauded as heroes. Now, I'm not saying I want to be called a hero. All I'm saying is um, I mean, perhaps the people of Zimbabwe need to look a little more critically at their leadership and hold them to account a little, a little more. Now, I understand it's a very sensitive and difficult situation because the powers that be have a lot of money um, and they have the systems uh, compromised, they basically uh, they dominate every sphere of life in Zimbabwe. They have the army, they have the police, they have the courts to some degree um, yeah, because of course there is an impartial judiciary in Zimbabwe but to some degree um, a lot of people feel it's not uh, easy for um, judges and magistrates to go against uh, the ruling party in Zimbabwe. So those are things that need tweaking, and I don't know how you tweak them. But one of the things I think that Zimbabweans ought to change is their per perception of people who want to um, stand up for what's right and um, call out uh, the powers that be that are abusing their power. I think there needs to be a switch in their mentality. You know, um, it's, uh, you see it in the West sometimes as well when you have whistleblowers who come out and expose corruption in a big company or a multinational or something. And it's weird how sometimes the whistleblowers are targeted as bad people, and yet the perpetrators of the crimes seem to be getting away with it scot-free. And I, and I think there needs to be some tweak in people's minds that if Zimbabwe is to be a better country in the future, people need to be a little more objective in their thinking, and they need to 
they need to see the situation through transparent eyes instead of with their own biases and their own political leanings. They just need to look at the facts. And, you know, Robert Mugabe was in power for 37 years. And people used to say to me when I used to call him a dictator, he's not a dictator. I'm like, you don't get to be in power for 37 years without being a dictator. Most countries allow you to be in power for two terms, four years, five years each, and then you're done, right? How do you go, how do you go on to be um, a dic- uh, someone who's in power for 37 years without being a dictator? And to stay in power, you have to do a lot of things that are unsavory, I think. And so perhaps the people of Zimbabwe need to uh, request a higher standard of leadership from their leaders, maybe. I don't know what it will achieve, but maybe. That, that's my two cents. You asked for it. That's what I think. Well, it was good uh, talking to you, Henry. Uh, thank you for uh, being with us on the program. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we run out of time. Although there's a lot that we can discuss. But uh, once again, it was good talking to you. Uh, wishing you the best with uh, more audiobooks, uh, with your intention of getting into commentary, and of course, uh, singing. Um, all the best, Henry. And thank you for being with us on Let's Talk. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me.